So when we proclaim the name of Jesus, power is released. Welcome to New Dawn Community Church, the message of the week with Pastor Randall Cutter. We have been studying what happened when the Apostle Peter and John went up to the temple at the time of prayer. And as they went up to the temple at the time of prayer, they ran into this guy who had been born lame. He'd been at the temple for all of his life. I mean, from the time he was able to ask for alms when he was of age or whatever, and he was responsible for taking care of himself, the people around there had gotten very used to him. He had been there at that temple gate. That was his spot. I don't know if he had that spot from the very beginning because I'm sure there was a pecking order of who had what corner and what gate. But at a certain point, he got that gate. And so that means everyone that's been going into the temple gate called Beautiful was running past this guy all the time And because it was considered meritorious to give alms, many of the people in the temple, many of the people who had gone up for prayer also had given this guy alms over the years. It is uh, important to note that Jesus certainly had seen this gentleman as he went in and out of the temple at the times that he was out begging, but Jesus would only do what the Father was doing. And what the Father was doing is setting up this guy to be healed by Peter and John not by Jesus. And so as a result, um, Peter and John had the opportunity to be able to do this incredible miracle. Jesus did more miracles than you can imagine, and that's clear from the book of John itself. He said that Jesus, you know, if you filled up the, the, if you wrote everything down that Jesus did, he doesn't even think the, the whole, he was using hyperbole, of course, but he didn't think the whole world had room for all the books that would have to be written. Remember, they had scrolls, and they weren't, you know, they weren't very compact. But Jesus did a lot, and this man, for whatever reason, maybe he missed the days that Jesus walked into the temple via the beautiful gate. There were other gates, and so, you know, there is a chance that Jesus did not encounter this man, but if he did, it was not the day that the Father had set aside for this man's healing for the purposes of the kingdom. God's timing is extremely important. Now, that doesn't stop us from praying for people and praying for their healing all the time because we're post-Christ. And we now know we walk under the authority of the Holy Spirit. And you got the, our basic theology is if someone has a need and we're there and we're carrying the Holy Spirit, we're going after it. We're going to pray for them. We're going to release life. That's our goal. That's what we do. But in that time of the establishment of the church, and the authority of what God wanted to do through his kingdom, this guy was waiting for Peter and John. And they healed him in a spectacular way. We've talked about that for the last couple of weeks. Here was a guy that was born lame who has no leg muscles. He has no ability to balance. He's never balanced on his legs in his life. Um, his, His muscles are atrophied to a point that... You know, you can't even begin to imagine his bones would have been so weak from the atrophy. He just never developed strength in his legs at all. And suddenly, Peter pulls him up, and he lands on his feet, and he's got strong bones. He's got full muscles, and he's got the ability to balance himself. This is an incredible miracle. It's not, it's not just, uh, you know, I, I've got a, a problem with my arm and uh, it's, you know, been hurting for a while. No, this is a guy who had no ability to walk and suddenly he was on his feet, jumping, praising God, celebrating, following the disciples everywhere. He was so close to them, he followed them right into the jail cell <laughs> because the disciples use the opportunity to call people to repentance in the name of Jesus. And we saw last week that the number of men now grew to about 5,000. And that's believers. And originally at Pentecost, it was 3,000 people. And when they went to 5,000 men, that reminds us of the fact that it was 5,000 men that were fed by Jesus. It's just these little touchstones. It's like there's these little 
echoes from the Gospels that come in. The 3,000 that were first saved on Pentecost, which was also the celebration of the giving of the law, reminds us of the 3,000 that were killed at the giving of the law at the golden calf incident. And then 3,000 were given life at the time that the church was empowered. And then as time went on, we suddenly have 5,000 men being added to the church, and the message is very clear. Jesus is the bread of life, and he is causing the multiplication of his church in the same way that he had multiplied the bread which was given to the 5,000 men. So now we've got a church of about, well, it's more than 5,000 people. It's probably 10,000, maybe 15,000 that the disciples are beginning to minister to. And we'll get into that in the next couple of weeks as we see how they administrate the, the, this, this brand new burgeoning congregation that God had given to them. But in the meantime, they're preaching. And it's Peter and John that are clearly speaking to the crowds. They're meeting with them. They're calling them to repentance in Christ. They're saying, you and your leaders acted in ignorance. And then the leaders show up. And they're very angry, we were told last week. They're very angry because they're teaching in the temple without a permit. That's even worse than not having a zoning letter. So they're preaching in the temple without a permit, and that isn't good. And then they're preaching Jesus, of all things. They're creating a commotion. And so it's late in the day. They drag them to the Sanhedrin. But, of course, it's not in session anymore. And so they just hold them overnight. Like I said, the guy that was healed was so close to them, he probably got held overnight also because he shows up the next day with them in front of the Sanhedrin. And so, obviously, we suspect that unless he was summoned early in the morning, that he had gone with them into the holding cell, wherever it was. And so now they are called before the Sanhedrin, and Peter gets up and just lets them know who Jesus was and preaches an amazing message. Now remember, this, this is Peter who only a couple months earlier couldn't stand up to a servant girl. One little servant girl around a campfire. I mean, there were soldiers around, but because of the fact that he was afraid of being arrested, he just backed away and even denied knowing Jesus. Called curses down on himself when the pressure got on because other servants got involved. And this same Peter, who had been so clearly reinstated by Jesus, at the shore of the Sea of Galilee, this same Peter that Jesus had warned and says, when you're restored, you, go, you strengthen the brothers. This same Peter who now was trying to lead the disciples was empowered at Pentecost in an amazing way and was able to stand up in front of the most powerful group besides Pilate in that city the group that had, along with Pilate, conspired to kill Jesus. And he was able to say clearly, you killed the Messiah. That is amazing, as he was attempting to call them to repentance and to the truth that there was forgiveness in Jesus even for them. So, today we have a chance to see what the Sanhedrin does and how they respond to this confrontation. And we're going to find out once again that as the pressure is applied to Peter, he obeys God when it counts. And that's what I've entitled today's message, Obeying God When It Counts. Because of the fact that, <laughs> you know, when he first got dragged in front of the Sanhedrin, he just went, well, I'm just going to tell him what's going on. And he basically preached the same message he had just preached to the crowds. But things get a lot more interesting as judgment is passed by the Sanhedrin, and Peter and John have to make a decision. It's the same type of decision we have to make all of the time when we decide, is it time to stand up for Jesus right now in this very difficult circumstance, or does wisdom dictate some other course? And, and uh, we'll find out what Peter and John thought. So, we are in Acts chapter 4, verses 13 to 22. Uh, the Scriptures that are going to be projected are my translations of the Greek New Testament, and uh, your, I encourage you to have your favorite translation open in front of you so you can see the nuances of translation that are in front of us. There's no big changes today. Different words and stuff, maybe word order, but 
So we are in Acts chapter 4, verse 13. When they saw the bold clarity of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and did not have religious training, they were astonished and they began to realize that they had been with Jesus. Ah, Peter had stood up and he had given them a resounding confrontation. And so he had a confident openness. Your translations handle that in a, a little you know, different ways, but the idea is that he was confident and he was absolutely open with what he believed. He wasn't holding anything back at this particular time. Now, and this, remember what he had said to them. This is what we saw last week. Uh, Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that it is by the name of Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by his name this man stands in front of you whole. There is no healing in anyone else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we can be healed. That's pretty confrontive. He's standing in front of the Sanhedrin and he says, you killed the Messiah. And you need to understand that it's in his name that this man was healed. This miraculous, this amazing miracle was done because there's no other name under heaven by which we can be healed. Now, I know many of you in your translations, as you look at this verse, you say, but my translation says saved, not healed. The Greek word soteria, or sozo is the verb, can mean healed. It can mean rescued. It can mean uh, saved spiritually. But in this context, it's pretty obvious, it's all about a healing moment. And when the Sanhedrin passes judgment, it isn't on whether or not, it's clear they understood that Jesus meant, or that uh, Peter meant healing, not salvation. Because if they thought for a moment that Peter was saying, you all need to trust in Jesus to be saved, they would have not let them out of prison they would have certainly made sure they were executed because that would have been the same blasphemy that they were executing Jesus for. If they thought that Peter was saying, Jesus is the only way to heaven, they would not have let them out of their grip. And so that's that's the clear indication of the fact that Peter, they understood Peter to be saying, there's no other name under heaven by which we must be healed. Now, by the way, is it true that there's no other name under heaven by which we have access to the Father and that salvation comes to us? Of course. But in the context which is in front of them, uh, they were talking about, see this guy? You want to be healed like that? There's only one way that that's going to happen. And that's going to be through the Messiah, by the way, whom you crucified. Just wanted to let you know that. Okay. So he, he was being very, very, very blunt. And so they're looking at him and they're thinking to themselves, this is a rather bold statement. And it's rather clear there was no equivocation. There's no, well, you know, let's just hold back on some of these things. And then they noted that they were uneducated and didn't have religious training. They were untrained. Um, There's a couple of Greek words here. If any of your translations say illiterate, that's not what the word really means. It's, uh, in fact, in Jewish culture, literacy was really high. They, they did really well with training people to read. It's not that they were illiterate. It's that they did not have the training in the scriptures. And they were, you could translate the second word when it says they didn't have religious training. You could translate it as they were laymen. That's, I mean, that's really, the Greek word is uh, idiotes, which of course you know what word we get from that. But it doesn't mean what our word means. It means to be untrained, to be a, a layperson, to not have the skill set in a particular area because th- they weren't rabbinic students. That's really what it meant. They had not received rabbinic training. Now, by the way, they were untrained, they were uneducated, and so I mean, in that particular sense, and so and with no religious training, and, and they were like, wow. Now, you have to understand the context of the day and age in which they lived. We can be untrained and not have religious training or or training in whatever area of specialty, because we're all uh, lay people with regard to some specialties. But we can also be self-taught. We've got libraries. We've got books. We've got YouTube. (laughs) You know that? (laughs) You want to fix your dishwasher? Get on YouTube. 
It'll tell you exactly how to fix whatever's wrong with it by model number, right? Or, or whatever it is. There's, there's all sorts of things. You can, you can go to, Scott, what's Santos' webpage? Or uh, you, Building with Papa? And he, he shows you how to build things, okay? You just go, hey, okay, great stuff. And he'll show you how to build things. If you want to know how to build a tree stand from scratch made out of wood, you go to Building with Papa. This is a free advertisement for Santo Minio's YouTube page. But, but there's stuff like that all over. You can be self-taught in so many different ways. And obviously, you're not getting the person to look at you make that, you know, when they say, and don't do this or the whole thing will blow up. You know, you know, they, you know it's nice to have a teacher at that point to say, who can grab your hand and pull it away from doing that. But, but otherwise, we have so many ways of being self-taught. They didn't have those ways because they didn't have books. Books were very expensive, scrolls. The documents that they had, very, very treasured. You just didn't have access to this stuff. So if you did not receive training in the, the, the skill, with, in rabbinic training, it was, it was for the religious training. Uh, if you didn't have training in that skill, you weren't going to get it either. And so that's what they saw with these disciples. How did they get this knowledge? Because they knew they didn't pop into a library and study on their own. They knew they didn't you know, get it any other way. So they were... They were thinking, huh, and so they were astonished at their presentation because they taught with men who had authority, just like someone else we know. Oh, his name was Jesus. And because of that, they also began to understand, they began to realize that Jesus had been their rabbi. The training that they had received was from Jesus. And that, as we know, wasn't enough to get them through Maundy, Thursday, and Good Friday in the sense of being able to successfully overcome all the temptation and problem that came against them. But post-resurrection and post-pouring out of the Holy Spirit, they became different people and the Holy Spirit was able to use what Jesus had poured into them so that they became different people. And that's really good news for us because whatever our past is, no matter what our past record is, no matter our, whatever our past circumstance is, Every day, with the Holy Spirit's help, he is able to make us into something that we were not. Now, every failure in our life can be used by the Holy Spirit to give us wisdom to avoid that type of failure in the future. He can use the very experience that we had, where we were, had a negative outcome, and he can use that experience to inform us in a way through his wisdom and his empowerment so that we are able to actually accomplish our purpose in life even better. Because God's not just the God of the second chance, he's the God who is able to take our first failures and make them into something amazing. That's, there's that very common picture of when you look at your life it's it's like a tapestry except you're looking at the back side of the tapestry and all it is is a bunch of knots and when you're standing in the presence of the lord you're able to see it from his side and it's a beautiful woven tapestry and when we look at our lives we're going to draw different conclusions about what god has done in our life than what is really being happening in our lives because God's weaving something that he's going to be able to show off for eternity, and we just don't have his perspective. And that's why the Apostle Paul said, I don't judge anything, I don't even judge myself, because I, I don't have the perspective I need to know what God's accomplishing through me. That'd be good advice for us to take. So, they were astonished at their presentation, and that's... <laughs> They said the same thing about Jesus. They were astonished. Back in John 7, how did this man know the scriptures without any religious training? How did, you know, they, don't, they were like, what? How does he know all this stuff? Because he didn't have the religious training that they suspected that he was going to need to have. Same thing with the apostles. And they began to realize, oh, they've been hanging around with Jesus. Not this again. Oh, this was a nightmare. After they had, none of them walked away from their encounter with Jesus and Pilate and putting him to death, none of them walked away feeling good about themselves. They thought it was a bad situation and they had to get through it and they did what was necessary. But it wasn't like they would point to that sterling moment in their lives and they were just hoping it would go away. And it wouldn't go away. 
It just kept coming back. I mean, he rose from the dead, the reports went out. They had to pay the guards in order so that the guards would not, you know, spill the beans upon what really happened. And then they were watching this movement beginning to grow after Pentecost. And now they had to deal with it because these guys were in the temple courts and there was this thing happening. So Acts chapter 4, verses 14 to 15. However... They were astonished, and they noticed that they were with Jesus. However, since they saw the man who had been healed standing with them, they did not have anything to say in response. After they commanded them to step outside of the Sanhedrin, they conferred with each other. Now, so they've got this, Peter has just confronted them in a major way. It's by no other name under heaven that we can be healed like this. You're, he's the Messiah, you killed him. You'd expect they would be able to respond to that, don't you? These guys made their living talking. They should have been able to respond. Hey, Jesus is the Messiah, and you killed him. Someone, you'd think, would say, I disagree with that. But because of the fact that this astonishing miracle had been done, and the guy is standing with them, they had a problem, and so they couldn't respond at all. So they were silenced by the obvious miraculous sign which had been done on this man. And the amazing, like, again, his legs went from being like that to being normal legs. I mean, we're talking about an amazing miracle, which everyone knew was an amazing miracle. So they didn't have anything to say. They were silenced. They didn't have any further questions. <laughs> what could they say? You know, they, they probably didn't want to ask any more questions because Peter had been so blunt and open with them. He might have gotten very personal. They didn't know. Called him out by name. And so they told him, hey, Step outside, we're about to have a private debate. That's what they're about to do. They were just, they were flummoxed, so they, what are we going to do? Uh, remember, I, I showed you this picture last week. This is an artist's conception of what the Sanhedrin would have been like. Uh, there would have been, if you, were the, if you were the one who had to stand in front of them, you were in that place of the accused somewhere in the center, and there were 35 members on your right and 35 on your left, and the high priest is in front of you, the clerk's behind you, students. I mentioned last week in that student section, the Apostle Paul, back then he was Saul of Tarsus, may have been sitting watching the affairs of what was going on. Uh, some people think he may even already have been in the Sanhedrin. We don't know. So um, he was certainly more than likely he was somewhere in that setting watching what is going on. And uh, they're in this thing, and they said, step outside. We have to converse privately. And so once the disciples stepped outside, obviously still under guard, they ask, what shall we do with these men? For it is obvious to everyone living in Jerusalem that a remarkable miracle has been done through them, and we cannot deny it. Think about that. We cannot deny deny it now that's okay they they were that's kind of their default mode well we can deny this miracle and they went no we can't deny this miracle that, i mean that's that, that's that, that was their default they would go and say this wasn't really a miracle but you couldn't do that with this guy and so it's almost automatic that they thought they you know it just this is our normal way of dealing with it we deny that it was a miracle well now we can't deny this is a miracle and so we're in trouble. It's obvious to everyone living in Jerusalem. So they were perplexed. Their course of action was not obvious to them as they were looking at things. Uh, the people clearly believed the miracle was from God, and um, they had a legal opinion too. By the way, remember, they were a, a legal body, and this is their legal opinion. Ready? It's from God. We cannot deny it. The people are right. So their legal opinion was that this miracle was from God. What was the other choice? Well, the other two choices were it's not really a miracle or it's from Satan. That was their mindset. So they had three options, and they clearly picked option number one. This is a miracle from God. Their legal opinion was that this was a miracle from God. And that, that's huge because they're the legal authorities over Jerusalem besides Pilate, and he's not going to be having a legal opinion about whether a miracle took place or not. This was the body that would make that opinion. And so he, he, uh, 
or they made the determination that it was from God. Now, the miracle was from God, but it was in the name of Jesus. That's so inconvenient. And so this is what they said. But in order that it not spread further among the people, we will forbid them under threat of punishment to speak any longer to anyone in this name. When they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. So they had a legal opinion, and the legal opinion was that this was a miracle from God. However, they would not agree that Jesus had anything to do with it even though the disciples were proclaiming that it was Jesus. There's kind of a little, uh, there's some lack of consistency here. They agreed the miracle was from God, but the messengers were wrong about the source of the miracle. That was their understanding, obviously. Um, They didn't want the fact that Jesus was the Messiah spreading. We cannot allow this to spread throughout Jerusalem. And so what they did now is, hey, what we're going to do is we're going to forbid them under threat of punishment to speak any longer. Because right now they had nothing they could prosecute them for. There was no law that they had violated. However, after they made this determination, there was now a law. And the law was going to be, we forbid you to talk about Jesus. And if you do it again, in the future, they can be prosecuted. And they can be found criminally liable under threat of law. And so they're making the law right now. By the way, if you think to yourself, how did did Luke, how did he get insight into what was going on in that meeting? Well, they probably took minutes. Maybe Saul of Tarsus was there. And remember, Luke was his traveling companion after he got saved. Uh, Maybe Nicodemus or Joseph of Arimathea were still in the council, and he heard from their perspective what the conversation was about. Whatever way, you know, he he found out all this information and their discussion and their formatting. And so they were establishing a legal basis for their future consequence. This was the gag order, because that's really what it was. Number one, you're not to speak in his name. That means you don't proclaim him anywhere in Judaism, really, because this was the Sanhedrin. They were in charge of all of Judaism. And number two, you're not supposed to teach him. That means you're not supposed to disciple individuals or groups. So you don't, you don't proclaim him, and you don't teach, even privately, in the name of Jesus. We are forbidding you to do that. That was now law based upon what they decided in that meeting. So they got a new law. The new law is that it is against the law to proclaim Jesus' name or to teach anybody about Jesus. Okay, so they were told about this. Um, And Peter and John responded and said to them, whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God, you must judge. Good question. They were the legal authorities of the land, right? And so, Peter and John now know that they have been forbidden to proclaim this name, and they now have been told, you don't do this anymore. And so they uh, now say, hmm, here's that boldness again. You could just... (laughs) You understand, they're in front of the most powerful people right there in Jerusalem, apart from Pilate. And they get told, don't ever speak in his name. I know, I know what, even if you're not intending to obey, you usually do this. Thanks for your time. Turn and walk away. Thinking, I'm going to do exactly what I'm supposed to do before God. That wasn't the new Peter. This was not the Peter who was at the campfire. This wasn't the Peter who could not stand up for Jesus in the face of a couple of servants. This was the Peter who was standing there listening to the Sanhedrin make a new law and saying, I'm going to disobey your law. Because you have to determine, you're the legal experts, 
whether it is okay to obey you rather than to obey God. You know, you, the Holy Spirit can make you really bold. Did you know that? <laughs> this is an amazing transformation. Uh, and Peter and John are basically instantly appealing the decision. They're saying, ah, eh, this doesn't work. You guys have to understand why this doesn't work. Um, because obedience to the decision puts them in a position of disobedience to God. That's their clear statement to the Sanhedrin. And so they, 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 they have this appeal. And so they're calling on the Sanhedrin to consider their quandary. They're, and by the way, they're commanding the Sanhedrin to judge it. This is, it's in the imperative. It's not just a suggestion. Peter is saying, you guys are going to need to judge this because we're coming back. That's, you know why they're coming back? Because they're going to get arrested again. And it certainly was, it happened. And we'll be back in front of the Sanhedrin again, not before too long, because they will be violating this law. And he tells them right up front, We'll be violating this law. You better figure out whether or not we need to obey God or we need to obey you. For we are not able to stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. Um, it's really interesting in the Greek language. Double negatives in the Greek language don't work the way our double negatives work. In English, if you put a double negative into a sentence, it becomes a positive. Okay? In Greek, it just reinforces the negative. And so what he says is, we cannot not speak. It, it's, 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 it, but he actually, it's, it's more of in the negative, but I'm just doing the real, you know, how to say it in a way that, that emphasizes the fact that he's saying, we're not doing this. And it's a no-no to you. I'm just, we're just, this ain't happening. We cannot not speak. It is impossible for us to keep our mouths shut because we've seen too much. And that's, you know, that's what he's saying. We've seen too much. And because we've seen too much, we're going to continue to share this. And because we've heard too much, we're going to continue to share this. But this is, this is Peter obeying God when it counts. That's the theme or the title for today's message because they're standing in front of people that have just said, we're making it illegal for you to share his name. And Peter says, you know, it's impossible for us to keep our mouth shut. We've had an experience that we cannot deny. There's a key. People with a theological argument are different than people with an experience. Now, I'm not saying that theological argument is bad. It's just that it's better when you also have an experience with it. <laughs> you know, it's always important to have everything based upon what Scripture says. But if you are just someone who has, an ex you know, has your faith based upon what scripture says with you know it, it, it there's there is a place where you're you're in faith and it's wonderful and blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe but when when Jesus does something in your life it just solidifies your theology now your experience backs up what you believe and you're saying to yourself, this is an amazing thing. I, I can't possibly back away from what it is that God has done in me and through me and here are the scriptures that back up what I am saying God is capable of doing. There's just things that happen. Why do you believe in the baptism of the Spirit? Well, because it's in the Bible. What does it look like? I'll tell you what it looked like for me. Because you've got an experience that now shows you. If you haven't had the experience of the baptism of the Spirit in an overt way or seen the power of God work in your life, what happens is you, you don't have that experience, so you just, it's kind of like, what does the Bible say about it? Which is a valid question, but now you've had an experience that lines up with what the Bible said, and you say, wow. Now, by the way, a lot of people, 
are baptized in the Holy Spirit without an experience that is separate from the point that they are saved. They get the whole package deal all at once. That's kind of like Cornelius. We'll find that out in a minute. They got saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit. Boom! Done! All at once! And so there may be no secondary experience of the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the person's life, but they can sure talk about that moment when God's Spirit grabbed them in faith, can't they? And all of a sudden... God's Spirit begins to change things in them. Gives them more authority when they speak. Gives them more insight and understanding with what it is that happened previously in their lives. And now he's kind of all weaving it together as I've already spoken. Uh, They find out that they may have been teaching before, but it didn't go much further than the first row. And now they're teaching and it's impacting lives and hearts. You understand that? That's stuff that happens whether you're charismatic or not. Because we got faith for those things. Every one of the gifts that God gives us through the power of his Holy Spirit is activated through faith. And if you don't have faith for a particular gift, you're just not going to walk in that. It doesn't matter whether you have the gift or not, you're not going to walk in it because you don't have the faith for it. But there are things that are acceptable gifts. Teaching, proclaiming, Uh, sharing the gospel, all those things are acceptable gifts throughout Christendom. And we've got a lot of anointed people who have got, uh, obviously, the baptism of the Holy Spirit using that gift as they are going. And then, when you're on the charismatic side of the coin, you're also believing that there's spiritual gifts for healing, and you're believing there's spiritual gifts for the prophetic, and you're believing there's spiritual gifts for hearing from God on higher levels, and, and, you're, and now you have faith for that, and the Holy Spirit energizes that, because you have faith for it, and you're able to step into it, and suddenly you're having experience where God is using you in ways that you never had thought of previously, and you're having an experience which validates what the scripture says, that there really are gifts of healing. There really are gifts of hearing from God. There really are gifts where God uses you to be able to release encouragement in people's lives. You have experiences which validate the fact that those things are still happening. And so when someone says, I don't believe those things happen anymore, you just say, yeah, that's your problem. (laughs) Otherwise, you would have the same experience that I do in these things. Because if you have experience in any of the gifts, it means that you have the possibility of stepping into other things that God may have gifted you with. Peter says, I've got an experience. What are you thinking? I can't step away from the experience of God that I've had. It doesn't work that way. And I know that does not work that way in any of our lives, and when the Lord has given us an experience and the pressure comes against us, the more experience we have with him, the much more difficult it is to disobey him when it counts. That doesn't mean that we are not fallible, frail people who under a moment's pressure might do the wrong thing or step away or muck it up. But what it does mean when we have a chance to think about it, we're not going to blow it again. Peter blew it once, he was never going to blow it again. Didn't mean he was perfect after that, he still did some things that were, you know, as Paul said later on, he, he got messed up when, you know, there was this thing about eating food, and, you know, the you know, non-kosher food and stuff. I mean, he was still a human being, he still had his prejudices, and he still had his, his comfort levels and all of that, but when he stood in front of that Sanhedrin that day, he was someone else. He was super, <laughs> superman. And God used him. So Peter says, we're not going to stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. So, Sanhedrin is not used to having people respond to them in quite this fashion. When they, had, when they had threatened them, there's a lot of pronouns here, so when the Sanhedrin had threatened the disciples or the apostles, even more, they released them. They could not discover a way to punish them because all the people were glorifying God for what had happened For the man who received this miracle of healing was over 40 years old. So right away, we've we've got the appeal rejected. (laughs) Peter says, you got to make the decision whether you're going to enforce this, you know, disobedience to God that you want in us. And it says, when they had threatened them even more. That means they rejected their appeal. 
They said, hey guys, we're telling you, if you speak in his name, we are going to do some nasty stuff to you. We, they threatened them. They said, this is the consequences of your decision if you choose to disobey us. What are some of the consequences that they could run into? Obviously, the, the 40 lashes minus one. The, the most you could whip a Jewish person under Jewish law was 40 lashes, and they always whipped them only 39 when they whipped them because of the fact um, that they didn't, if they miscounted along the way, they didn't want to disobey God's law. By the way, when we say that Jesus was whipped by the Romans, they didn't have that restriction. Jesus could have gotten 10 lashes with the scorpions, that's the ones with the metal things at the end, or he could have gotten 100 lashes, and we don't know the number. Of course, if he had 100 lashes with metal in tips, whips, he probably wouldn't have been alive at the end of it, but um, they did not have that, that same law. That was a Jewish law, and they would not use metal tipped whips, um, but, or, you know, scourges. Uh, so they, but that was the, one of the things that could happen. They could be fined. I mean, they could have been fined by the authorities and thrown in jail until they paid the fines. They could have been imprisoned, I mean, just without the fines. Um, or they could have been sentenced to death. They would have needed the Romans' help with that, but they could have got them for sedition or something like that. They knew how to do that sort of thing. Um, so they warned them. They threatened them. They said, well, if you continue to do it, we're spelling out for you what's going to happen. By the way, we do know that the next time they were brought in before the Sanhedrin, they were whipped. They violated the law. The Sanhedrin said, yep, yeah, you're getting whipped. So that was their first course of action with the disciples. It, by the way, speaks about Jesus' popularity that they never were able to whip him until his time of humiliation. They, they just didn't have the ability. The crowds were too, they, they were all around all of the time. And he was able to walk through the crowds when they wanted to stone him or whatever. So. And then it says they could not discover a way to punish them because all of the people were glorifying God. So they released them, which means that's an acquittal. They said, now you haven't broken any laws, you're on your way. And they're saying, we're going to break some laws in the future. <laughs> this was just a short-term you know, fix, so okay. So uh, anyway, they... It was difficult to punish them, it says, because everyone was praising God. How do you punish someone that, for the sin of getting people to praise God? It's difficult. When you're the religious authorities who've been trying to get people to praise God. And it says uh, one of the reasons they couldn't is because this man was over 40 years old. As I said at the beginning, he was a fixture in Jerusalem. And everyone knew that if you've been... If you have been lame for 40 years, you cannot walk, uh, this is a congenital issue, you were born this way, you just did not spontaneously recover. And we talk about spontaneous remission when we have cancer issues or we have all those things. We call them healings usually, but, but everyone knew this could not be a spontaneous healing. This isn't just the guy suddenly recovered because too much happened all at once. It was obviously a healing from God. Everyone's praising God. And as the Sanhedrin looks at it all, they go, oh, let him go. But warn them. And they taught us and teach us a lot about obeying God when it counts. Because Peter went, he didn't just say, he didn't just stand in front of them and say, Jesus is the Messiah, and you killed him. When they told him never to mention it again, he said, that's an impossible order. We will not be obeying that. That's amazing. And it's a reminder to us that there are going to be times that we have to say difficult things. Be led by God. Remember, here's the one thing that we have instructing us all of the time. Be as innocent as doves, but as shrewd as serpents. So there are times that we're going to think, do I lay my cards on the table or don't I? Peter was leading the charge in Jerusalem right now to stand up for Jesus, and so his calling was clear. But we're always in, as innocent and dove, as doves and shrewd as serpents, so we're always asking the Holy Spirit for wisdom about what's the best thing to do also. You know, I, I, uh, I love witnessing for Christ. Always be prepared to give an answer for the hope that you have within you. I'm, I, I'm not an evangelist. I'm, I'm much more of a prophetic teacher, and so my giftings energize me in a particularly different way. But I'm always ready to be able to give an answer for the hope that I have within me. And I, I look for wisdom in being able to present that sort of thing. And for me, it's not wisdom to stand on the corner with a bullhorn. 
and to be able to call people to repentance. And uh, uh, Josh is at the University of Michigan, and he talks about the fact that there's people with bullhorns that show up on campus quite regularly, not normally from recognized Christian groups, but they'll stand up and tell everyone to repent and tell them they're all going to hell. And, you know, just, and you have to think, I don't know if that's really wisdom. Because there's not a lot of love in that. There's not a lot of relationship building. There's not a lot of miracles that happen before they do that. I, I'm not certain that's wisdom, but I'm, who knows what their calling is. I just, I know it's not my calling. And if I saw one of you doing that, I'd say, let's talk about wisdom. Because I'd say, I don't think you're accomplishing what you think you're accomplishing. What you're accomplishing is getting people really ticked off at you who will never listen to you again. Because of the fact that you're releasing something that you know, to them is negative. We are, we, we, but we never back away when we're put into that place where we have to answer for him. Peter and John showed us that. It's always important to obey God when it counts. And they demonstrated that in a clear way. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity today to study your word, to understand more about how you live in and through us, and to see how Peter and John reacted to the persecution they were receiving. I ask, Lord, that you would make us people who have that same boldness and the wisdom to know how to use it appropriately. Use us in your kingdom. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen.